thank you for being here today as we can share this time together. This series that we're beginning is called In the Meantime. You know, and this is a phrase I've used, you know, we've, we've all used this phrase, I think, somewhat in our lives. And I've begun to take a different understanding of this word. For some of us, when we're waiting, this meantime is really mean. It's hard. In the meantime, I've gotten a whole new definition for this now. This is in the hard time, the time between when things are going really good to where things are going to go really good again. This in between time is hard. It's mean. And we're going to spend the next six weeks talking about being in the meantime. Does it have to be mean? Most of us think so. Most of us feel that way. We're going to be looking at kind of this question. What do you do when there's nothing you can do? What do you do when you're in a spot in life where there is nothing you think you can do? No way to move forward. No way to make change. Are you in that spot right now? I'm not asking you to raise your hand, but I feel like I am in a lot of ways. I'm in that spot right now. And so that's the reason I think when most messages, series that we begin, I kind of find them as they speak to me. Because I feel like I'm in this spot. What do you do when there's nothing you can do? When there's questions, but there's no answers. Maybe it's a relationship that you're in that's just not going right. Maybe it's financially. Why is it I work so hard, work so hard, I do everything I can, and the guy at work got the job ahead of me? Or why is it that I just seem to work every day and I never get a raise, or the money's just never enough? We've got these things. Physically, for those of you that have survived cancer, there's a time in there where you know there's nothing that you can do about it. It's completely up to God and completely up to doctors of what's going to happen. As you get older, there's just more things that come along. It's not just cancer. It's, you know, I have a good friend who's suffering with Parkinson's disease. And when I talk with him, it's, he has, I think, probably one of the best attitudes you can have towards it, but there's not a good future there. You know, the, 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 the good is that today, due to the new medicine that he's on, that his hands only shake when he gets tired. But he knows the time is going to come where he won't be able to walk. He knows the time, and he knows what the disease will do. And so, what do you do when there's nothing that you can do? What do you do when you go and you look for this new job or this new step in life, and they say, you didn't go to college, so you don't, you don't qualify. You didn't finish high school, so you don't qualify. What can you do? It's been so interesting, especially in the last, I would say, 10 years. The number of people who are in their 50s who all of a sudden find themselves out of work. And somebody saying to them, well, you might have experience, but you don't have the right degree. You didn't go to the right school, and so there's no work for you anymore. So all the dreams of retirement are gone. We've all got, I think we've got one of these. Most of us have gotten one of these. If you haven't experienced it, you're blessed. And I'm just saying you're going to come up on one of these sooner or later. And probably the thing that you want to do most is run away from it. Have you ever thought how bad you might want to run away from home? When life gets rough, it'd be nice just to run away and take up a new house. Maybe move to Colorado and change your name and live there and try to make it day by day because you're in such a spot now that there's nothing that you can do. 
You want to run away? Do you want to abandon the relationship you have? You abandon the family you have? Run away from your spouse? You want to start drinking? You want to start hiding it in drug use? You want to become resentful and become angry. You know, and I see that probably more than anything else about this, of people who find themselves in a space where they think there's nothing they can do about where they are, they become angry people. They become people that nobody else wants to be around. And when that happens, it just gets worse. Of being angry. And you're to the point that there's nothing that you can do. And we have three things kind of basically that we feel when we get into this spot. When I say we, I'm including me because like I say, I understand this fully. The three things are, I'll never be happy again. Nothing good can come from this and there's no point in continuing. I'll never be happy again. When you don't see where there's any way to get out of the circumstance you're in, that's a typical thought. I'm never going to be happy again. We spend all the time thinking about, oh, back when things were so good, and back when my children were little, or back when this was happening and that was happening, life was so good and I was so happy. And chances are, if we remember really accurately back to then, we wouldn't feel that happy. But we're looking back and saying, oh, life was just so good, da, 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 da. And I'm never going to be happy again. Nothing good can come from this. We just feel like that we're in such a low spot, such a low state that nothing good can come from this. There's only one way to go is up and it's not happening. And there's no point in continuing. Why should I keep doing this? But what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? We get into these things. And, and it's so easy when we get into these things. If you're a Christian, and it's, I, I should, I'm going to say if you're a Christian, most of the time, after we get to a certain point in this, we blame God about this. We say, God, you've abandoned me. And if you're not a Christian... This is one of those times where you say, well, I'm glad I'm not a follower of God because obviously he's not real. Or I wouldn't be in this spot. So this is what we're going to be talking about today and for the next few weeks is where does this story fit into us as being Christians? Where does this way of thinking fit into us and our relationship with God? The couple of points that we need to understand, and it will be the kind of a basis of what we're talking about here. If you're in one of these places, there's things you need to know. God is not absent, apathetic, or angry. God is not absent. It's not that he doesn't care, and it's not that God is angry with you. I find it interesting, of these three, I find it interesting to f talk to people and they say, when things happen and they say, God is, must be obviously mad with me. And I think if we understand that God loves us the way that the scripture teaches that God loves us, that God is not mad with you. God's not mad. And I think we're going to need to realize that we, we, we feel abandoned by God and that God is this apathetic. It's not that God doesn't care. I think God is with us. But we don't feel it anymore. And God is not absent. God is with us. But we want to know that God cares and we want to feel God's presence and we're in the middle of this thing and we're down in this pit and we don't feel his presence, we don't think God cares, and we feel alone. I think it, it, it's, it's interesting that we do have times in our life when we don't want to feel God's presence. And all of us, if you've been, where are you at, Ty? Ty is probably gone. There's Ty. He's with the youth group because I was going to pick on Ty while he's here. We all have these times in our lives where we don't want God to be present in our life because we're going to get in trouble. 
How many of us, especially guys, how many of us have been in a car going like 100 miles an hour and you know that that's wrong? Especially if you're driving it. Especially if you got four or five people in the car with you. Or am I just talking about myself? You know, we've all done some things where we really don't want God to be there in, but there's times when we want God there. And this is what we're talking about, these times, these hard times. We're going to look at two scriptures today that speak about this. And today we're going to kind of be, we're going to end today kind of on a, on a somber note. And I just want you to come back next week and, so we can start from there and go. Because these stories, these stories are hard. These stories talk about people feeling abandoned. And maybe, were they? We'll talk about it. We'll look at it. We're going to, the first one we're going to look at is in Matthew. This is a story about... The, the man that we all know, if you've been in church much time, is called John the Baptist. He was called that because he wasn't part of the Baptist church. There was no Baptist church then. He was the baptizer. He was the man that was known throughout the countryside to where if you wanted to be baptized and cleansed of your sins, you met him at the Jordan River and he baptized you. That was who he was. That was what he did. We're going to start into Matthew in the 11th chapter. We're going to look at verses 2 and 3. But Jesus is with his disciples, and he is instructing them about going out and beginning to teach and to lead. And someone comes up to him, several people come up to him, and they ask him a question. And it's a very unusual question from a very unusual source. I want to look at it. Matthew 11, 2 and 3. When John, John the Baptist, we just talked about, who was in prison? He was in prison. There's a long story. We'll finish this and I'll get back to it. Was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah. He sent his disciples, John's disciples, to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? A little more background into this whole story about John the Baptist is in prison. It's, it reminds you of something that would happen in Amelia County, the whole story of why he's in prison. But, <laughs> but he's not. He's there where Jesus is living in that area. John was put in prison because he was talking about King Herod. And what happened there with King Herod, trying to make it sound as simple as I can, King Herod had married his brother's wife, taken her from his brother. Now that was bad enough, but this wife was King Herod's sister's daughter. So we hear all these jokes about, you know, the, the, the tree don't the spread very far in a lot of places, well it really didn't there. His wife was his niece. And so that's a little too kind, that's a little too close even for southern people. You know, we, <laughs> we, 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 that's a little too close for even southern people. And so John the Baptist saw this and talked about it. The wife's mother, the king, the, the emperor's sister was Herodias. She did not like him talking about it. He was apparently a preacher about it all around the countryside about how evil Herod was that he had married. He had not only taken her from his brother, but had married his cousin, his niece. And so Herodias didn't like it. And so she convinced Herod to have him arrested and put in jail. What he did is he took him, John the Baptist, and put him in a jail more or less out in the desert where it was hot, where it was very uncomfortable. 
He wasn't tortured from what we can read, and, but he was just put there and left. There's no trial, no jury, no sentence. You're just there. I read, read one person say this week that there was no food. I've heard other stories to where there was food. One of the places I read this week talked about there was no food and people that supported you had to bring food for you to survive. Point being, he's in prison there. And so he's been in prison for about a year. And he sends some of his followers back and he's thinking, nothing good's going to come from this. I've been in prison here a year. Jesus is my cousin. I'm the one who baptized him in the river. He thinks I'm okay. So why am I still in prison? So the scripture. Jesus, John sent some of his followers to ask him, are you really the one? John the Baptist is now d doubting whether Jesus is really who Jesus says that he is. So if John the Baptist can doubt it, we can too when we get into that spot. Again, John the Baptist is one of Jesus' favorite people. In Matthew 11, 11, this is what Jesus says. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. No one more important, nobody, not even your mother. Nobody was better in this world than John the Baptist. Moving back to Matthew in the fourth chapter, going to verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, what do you think Jesus would have done? You think Jesus would have somehow, a miracle would have happened, the door of the hope would have opened in the prison, and John would have walked out and everything would have been fine. You would think at least Jesus would go to visit him in the prison. You would think that Jesus would at least send someone to help him. Jesus could have done any of these things. Verse 12. What did Jesus do? He withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum. If you have as much knowledge of that area as I do, which is very little, but if you know where this is, Capernaum is was a beautiful place to go. It was right there by the Sea of Galilee. It was beautiful. You could look out in the palm trees and the weather was nice most of the year. And so Jesus, thinking about John the Baptist, maybe, instead of going to help John the Baptist, instead of going to help get him out of prison, instead of performing a miracle to where John would be saved, Jesus goes further away and stays in an area that's really nice. So what was John the Baptist supposed to think? Jesus says in verse 6 this. He says, Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. I think this is what he was trying to get us to see was John the Baptist is in prison. But blessed are those, says, who do not stumble on account of me. Blessed are those who can keep their faith no matter what happens. Blessed are those who can keep their strength in their belief in me, Jesus, no matter what happens. Don't interpret God's silence as absence. Don't, and he was saying to John's followers, for John not to interpret that he wasn't there as that he didn't care. Now, that's a hard story. That's a hard story to follow. Because do you know how it turned out? John the Baptist was beheaded in prison and killed.
The next story. The next story comes from uh, John. The Gospel of John starting in the 11th chapter. This is sometime later after this event that happened with John the Baptist. But Jesus is in the region where John the Baptist baptized most of the people close to the Jordan River in that area. And somebody comes to him and says, verse 11, excuse me, chapter 11, verse 3. Lord, the one you love is sick. And that's, who is that? Who is the one that Jesus loved? Who is the one that anyone would know that he loved probably more than anybody else? If, sir? Lazarus. Lazarus. If you know and you've, you've read some of the parts of the Bible that Jesus spent his kind of off time with Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. He was welcome in their home. It was kind of like his home too. He was that close. And so this person comes up and says, Lord, the one you love is sick. Verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Wow, what did you would, you would think he would do? This is the person that, that well, if you were part of Jesus' followers, when I say Jesus' tribe, the people who followed him around, they knew who this person was that he loved. And he just says, well, we're going to wait a while. And so everybody was just kind of wondering, what is wrong here? How is it that Lazarus is sick, they're thinking he's going to die, and you're not going to do nothing about it. How come? You know, you watch different movies that have re-shown this. In the, like I know the AD series, was the second half was finished up. And I, I love those because I think they show it pretty realistically. You know, the, the disciples thought him were just kind of scratching their head, just saying, what's happening here? How come you're not going to him? This is the guy that you probably love the most in the world, and you're not going. If you know the Bible story, you know how it turns out. And you know there was a reason for Jesus not going. But for the people at the time, for Martha and Mary, they didn't understand. There was no reason that Jesus didn't show up. Think about how it would be. You're one of the, wow, if you truly felt that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the Son of God, and he's been at your house so many times, and you're good friends, wow, what a place to be. How blessed could you be to be that person? And here you've sent a message to Jesus saying, look, your best friend, your best bud, your best, you know, your number one Facebook follower is sick. Come and help us. And Jesus says, no, I'm just going to wait. So when we, when we get into the scripture and we read this story about Martha and Mary, if you remember, two days later, Jesus went on. And he finally got there and he stayed kind of outside of town. It's how the scripture shows us. He stayed outside of town and Martha and Mary came out to him. And I've always wondered why he didn't just immediately go to the house. Because the house was full of all these mourners and Martha and Mary were all very upset. And I think he didn't necessarily want Martha and Mary to make a fool of themselves in front of their friends. To where he stayed outside of town and they both came. And you know, I think they were ticked with him. I think they were angry. They were so deep in their grief. They were missing their brother. Their brother had died. And why is it you didn't come help us? What happened? The story goes, as most of you know, Jesus brought Lazarus back to life. And there was a lot of wonderful teaching that went on there about having enough faith. Enough faith in Jesus Christ to where if no matter what happens, if you can stick with your faith, if you can stick with your belief in God, if you can stick with your understanding that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, then 
you're going to get through this. And so this is what we're going to continue to talk about. That we don't need to confuse God's apparent absence for apathy. He's not absent or angry. God is there with us through these hard times, through these tough times. And it's really hard when you feel that I'm here and I'm trying to do everything that God's calling me to do and nothing is working right. Nothing. What is it that I'm doing wrong? Have you abandoned me, God? Have I made you mad? What is it? What is happening here? And when we get into this, we lose our hope, our joy, and our purpose. We lose our joy. Well, we, we, we begin to think, I'll, I'll never be happy again. Nothing good can come from this, and there's no point in continuing. We lose our hope, our joy, and our purpose. When with this, I'll never be happy again, we feel that there's no more joy. Our hope, nothing can come from this, and the purpose, there's no point in continuing. What we're going to be talking about today and for the next five weeks is because I think we are all have been in this spot. And I'm hoping that we're going to learn that I can be happy. Something good can come from this and there's a purpose to this pain. Where are we? Are you living this right now? In some ways, I am. Are you living this right now? As I look around and look at many of you, I think some of you are. I think you're living with, not all my life is terrible, but you know, there's just, this is this one part, whether it's my health, or whether it's a relationship, or whether it's loneliness, or whether it's finances, that I just don't see a way to get out. I don't see where this is ever going to get better. And we've got to remember, if we can keep our faith, that God will see us through. And the typical answer is, well, how long is that going to take? It might take a long time. It might take the rest of your life. It might take till tomorrow. We don't know the answer to that. But we've got to know that if we can't keep our faith strong, no matter what it is we're going through, that we're going to get into this pit we're going to get into this place and we are going to lose all hope. We're not going to find joy in every day. And you know, sooner or later we're going to find we don't even have a purpose to be here. We're going to talk more about this. This is a solemn subject, I think. And it fits into a whole lot of us. We're going to be talking more about this in the weeks to come. If you don't need to know this today, you're going to need to know this someday. That no matter how bad it gets, how low we feel, that God is there. That God loves you. That God is with you, not absent. And that God cares. Pray with me, please. Dear Father, we have come today and we, some of us, me, you need to be reassured at times that we're on the right track. That we are hearing you. We 
when there is silence, we do begin to say to ourselves, what have I done wrong? Is it my fault I'm not hearing? Is it something I'm not doing right? Is it some way I can change and improve? And you know, maybe it is. But help us not to interpret silence as you not being there and not loving us. Help us to be able to wait. As Betsy said to the children, it may be more than three years. Help us to wait. So Father, we ask for your guidance. Ask for your help. Help us to understand. Please hear our prayer. Amen.